Hello and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. I am Joe Devine. Today's episode is called Sensible Transfers. Now, what does that mean? That means that uh, Alex Stewart here, who joins me today, hello. Hello. Uh, you are here I- I- acting in your role as uh, TIFO's head scout. <laughs> yes. Or, or director of football. Something like that. Or big pretender. Big pretender. Big pretender. Mostly big pretender. Yes. Um, and what we're going to do, uh, I should let you know as well, we've got a few videos coming out in this vein, club specific, um, some of the big clubs in the Premier League, maybe elsewhere too. We haven't, we haven't really decided yet. But the aim uh, is to uh, talk about transfers. It's the summer, of course, and the window is open. Uh, things are happening. People are moving. It's very exciting. Um, but we, don't, we tend to avoid uh, talking about it, partly because we can't create videos quickly enough to get them out in time for them to be relevant. For example, we were going to make a video, or we are making a video about Daniel James. I believe that is going out. Uh, tomorrow, if you're listening to this on day of release. Um, but of course, he finalised his move to Manchester United mid-process of uh, creating the video, <laughs> which can be quite irritating, so we have to change a lot of things, go back and change things. That's uh, why we don't do it. Also, we don't really deal in rumours here. Um, so what we've done is uh, we've decided to take one of the most exciting parts of football and make it as boring as possible uh, <laughs> so that it fits with the TIFO brand. Well, now, what does that mean? That means we asked uh, our listeners last week for suggestions in the form of club and role on the pitch. And uh, we wanted to know who listeners and fans would like to see fill those roles at their club. For example, the first one on the list is Manchester United goalkeeper in the event that David De Gea leaves. And so what we tasked Alex with doing is, uh, I mean, you're probably better placed to explain this to me, but from what I understand, you looked at uh, stats and tactics to, that's right, isn't it? To work out exactly well, well, who you, should be. You've the, got a the, funny face, so when you say <laughs> that. Because I don't know what, don't know what you've done. Yeah. Tell you what, in two words, not two words, two minutes, uh, please explain the process going forwards because some of the names that we're going to hear, you suggest here, mm. aren't the names that have appeared in the newspapers. Because no. many of them are not super niche, but they're not, they're not from the room mill, are they? No. Um, it is worth saying before we start that sometimes the rumour mill makes sensible suggestions. Like and what? So, for example, there was an article on who scored recently about midfield options for Spurs, and it was coming up with names like La Celso uh, and Ndombele. These are perfectly sensible. There are fringes of the rumour mill, though. Right. There are, there are players out there who are linked with clubs for good reason and would fulfil criteria. And there are plenty of people who are smart who are writing about this sort of stuff. However, what I think is interesting is to look at, um, rather than the idea that a club should just go out and buy the most famous player or, in some instances, a kind of putative best player, where might they find somebody who is suitable for their specific requirements? Uh-huh. And we're so, thinking on field, we're not including things like uh, the brand value of the player. No. It's not Paul Pogba's coming because he's good, but also because he'll increase brand awareness for Manchester United. Correct. Purely on field. Purely on field. And, and also what I've tried to do where possible is to look at what the... So if somebody has said, uh, you know, Watford needs a centre-back, what is it? That, that Watford require in a centre-back rather than Manchester United might require in a centre-back or Wolves might require in a centre-back. And I'm going so, to force you to explain these decisions. I'm going to try and explain. Yes, I'm okay. going to try and explain them. Now, some of, some of these people that I'm going to suggest are, you know, it won't happen. It'll never happen. But, mm-hmm. but the, the idea is That's almost... That's why they're sensible transfers. Right. The idea is almost to kind of give a, a window into how you can approach the idea of scouting players in a more kind of thoughtful and holistic way, rather than saying, we need to buy somebody uh, who are the best five players in that position Uh in Europe, because we're Man United, we can go and spunk 200 million pounds on a player and that's fine. Because that isn't necessarily the most sensible way of doing it. No. Okay. Right. Well, sensible transfers, I suppose sensible in quite a pejorative sense, they're not necessarily... uh... Well, there are clubs out there who are definitely doing sensible transfer business. Yes. And Um, I should stress as well that the videos that we are going to create around this topic, they they veer slightly more somewhere between what we're going to do here, which are transfers which will probably never happen, and the rumour mill, which are also transfers which will probably never happen. We're we're trying to take a, a slightly more holistic approach there 
and find players who uh, are maybe being mentioned or at least are we're considering the price tag and stuff like that in the videos. Yeah. The first of which I believe comes out uh, next week. We'll be doing them throughout the summer, so I'm sure you'll see them. Um, let us begin then, Alex. Yeah. Uh, the, the example I mentioned before, and uh, uh, this one was suggested by uh, G. Clevaria, yeah. who asked your opinion on the best goalkeeper to bring in for Manchester United. Now, there's no this person hasn't specified whether that is to replace David De Gea. I think we're going to assume that that would be the case. Yeah. Um, so in this instance, I actually cheated slightly, and I went and spoke to a guy called Aidan Ray, who I know from Twitter, who is a goalkeeping analyst. Um, and the two, I mean, he provided a number of suggestions, but there are two ones that are clearly very sensible. Um, and this is partly because it's likely to be some sort of swap deal involving De Gea. So, so De Gea may wish to go to a club that can pay him a huge amount of money, like PSG. And PSG have a goalkeeper on their books in Kevin Trapp, who's just had a fantastic season with Frankfurt. Um, ridiculously good um, long pass completion, for example. So if, if United, uh, uh, I think someone was linking United with Sebastian Haller the other day. Right. Um, as a, a good, strong, airily dominant centre forward. Now, obviously, you want to progress the ball to them well, and starting from the back as a goalkeeper is a good way of doing that, particularly as United aren't brilliant at building from the back through their defenders. So someone like Trapp, where you would be able to get him probably very cheaply or possibly even get a fee from PSG plus Trapp for De Gea would actually not be a bad piece of business. Also, I would like to say at this point that uh, whilst David De Gea is praised for many things, one of the things which sometimes I think goes unnoticed is his long passing ability because he's quite good at that, isn't he? As far as goalkeepers go, he's quite good at uh, quick not, breaks. Yeah, he's not bad. Um, I think he's pretty good at throwing as well, which is another nice way of, of progressing the ball quickly. The best goalkeeper in the world is Jan Oblak, probably at the moment. I think that's a fairly reasonable thing to say. I mean, Marc-Andre Testegen is definitely up there. Um, Edison and Allison are also both up there. But Where does can, De Gea fit in that? Um, I'd say he's he's in that probably top five bracket. Um, obviously, it's difficult to judge goalkeepers outside of looking at their defence as some sort of context. Um, there are a couple of really good goalkeepers out there who are much, much better value. So Alex Merritt, who's at Udinese, for example, Walter Benitez, who's at Nice. They're both goalkeepers I would be looking at as well. Mm -hmm. However, a club like United will probably want to make a statement signing. And because De Gea has been consistently excellent for them, um, apart from maybe his first season where he looked to bed in, it would be one of the few areas where if I were United, I would consider throwing serious money at a goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. How um, old is Kevin Trapp? How old is he? Yeah. Uh, I will just... He's 28. He's 28. And um, what's happening with Buffon at the moment, who was PSG's first keeper? Buffon's been released. He's been released. By so PSG. Who, who, it, it, presumably, if PSG don't buy another goalkeeper, will Kevin Trapp be... Well, they've got... No, they've got Alphonse um, Ariola, I think is how you pronounce his name. Okay. Yeah. Um, who is a French international. Okay. Um, he, I mean, he's back up usually to Larice, but yes, he's, he's good. He's come through the youth ranks at PSG. Um, so it's likely that he would be a first choice. It's always difficult to know because there have been rumours recently, for example, that PSG are looking at Kayla Navas, right. who is, you know, out of favour at Real Madrid. And also the Real Madrid goalkeeping situation is complicated because Luka de Zidane, Zinedine Zidane's son uh, is in the Real Madrid B team, played one La Liga game, I think, last season, or possibly two. I think he definitely started against Huesca. Um, so Zidane may wish to say, well, we've got Courtois. He's clearly our number one. Yeah. You know, I'm going to let Luca be the number two, in which case Kayla Navas, who is a very, very good goalkeeper, is surplus to requirements. Right. It, it's a shame, isn't it? Because I, I, I do remember... Um, a few years, obviously, the De Gea to Real Madrid rumours, as part of the rumour mill, have been yeah. uh, have been uh, festering for a while. Um, but I remember a few years ago, before uh, Madrid had bought uh, Thibaut Courtois, uh, Keylor Navas put in consistently excellent performances. I mean, such a fantastic goalkeeper. I'm surprised that 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 he's just sat on the bench there. Yeah, but I I think. 
I think in that regard, it's maybe indicative of the way that Real Madrid think about players more generally, mm. which is that either, you know, obviously they had Ica Casillas for over a decade, I think, and, and he was a homegrown player who, you know, started the, the Champions League final when he was 17 and was still going to training on a bus or something. So they either like their players to be that or they like their players to be, you know, kind of world beaters in their position, which is why mm. they've just signed Hazard. It's why they're being linked with Pogba. Navas, I think, is the kind of player who is, you know, he, obviously he's not homegrown, but he's also not a big enough star, a big enough name, maybe for them to feel comfortable with him. Mm. Um, Courtois is more that. I Courtois wonder, won the Golden Gloves at the World Cup and yeah. so on and so forth. So I wonder if with, with Kaylon Navas, though, it's, I mean, the, these things, whether someone is considered a big player or not, they tend not to take into account uh, the full uh, the full breadth of the statistics of the player, for example. Could this be a perception issue whereby Keylor Navas has been at Real Madrid, uh, where he's sort of been criticised over time, or there's been he's always been party to lots of conversations about other bigger name goalkeepers coming in, where it, it, the issue really is only perception? Because, I mean, every time I've ever seen him play, I, for example, if he were playing for Real Betis, would Real Madrid fans not be watching him going, wow, that that guy's amazing. He's a big name. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, I, I, I do think that there are certain clubs where there is this oddity, and I think Manchester United sometimes fall into this trap, for example, where there's an idea of recruiting a certain kind of player, which is not necessarily just a player who's very, very good at what they do, but carries with them something. Mm. Um, and, you know, that if you look at the someone like Pogba, you know, Pogba, I think Pogba is an excellent midfielder. I think he's been poorly used and I think he's got increasingly frustrated with that. But there's no doubt that in signing Pogba, you're not just signing a very, very good creative midfielder. You're, you're signing, a, you know, a personality. You're, you're signing somebody who does, and, and I'm not talking about something as, as kind of base as shirt sales, although there, obviously, there are, you know, commercial imperatives there too. But it's a statement signing. Um, well, let's let's come on to uh, well, Paul Pogba in a way because the next suggestion, and they're not all Manchester United. Don't worry. Um, the next suggestion is from Nathan Tipook, who asks for a central midfielder for Manchester United. Now, this is an interesting one because I feel like Man United have bought a central midfielder once per season for the last ten years, and none of them, <laughs> none of them have become club stalwarts exactly. Yeah. And the Herrera is outgoing. Is your, are you looking for someone to replace him, for example? I'm looking for someone to replace Herrera, really. Uh, I, I mean, I think you're right about United. I think, I think it's odd how players have, so for example, Morgan Schneiderlin, who they spent, I can't remember exactly, but it's... 37, some, I think. I, I was going to say somewhere around 35, but yes, that, that, that makes sense. Um, on a player who, for us, was excellent, us being Southampton, um, and... United have always, uh, subsequent to that kind of um, the the Glazers taking over, and that there seems to have been a, a weakness around that particular part of the field mm. um, in terms of knowing exactly what it is they want to do, and and the kind of player that they need to to fit in with that role. So, for example, if you look at the acquisition of Pogba, if I'm buying Pogba, I'm only spending that much money on a player even if he's brilliant, if I know exactly how I'm going to use him. Obviously, part of the issue here is that United have gone through a cycle of managers who will play stylistically very differently. So that, that does increase the issue. But with, with questions over how much of a role they play in incoming transfers, you yeah. know, it sounded like when Mourinho was there that he would often, he would either ask for a player or he would be offered a player and then he would have to decide whether he wanted them or not. And I assume this, the latter of those isn't necessarily the right way to go about scouting. Well, no, I don't think it is. But then I also think if you're, if you're a manager, okay, there are, there are some managers who are extremely tactically flexible. And so what they're looking for in terms of a player is somebody who is adaptable, who can play in a number of different positions. Someone like one of the names I've got on my list, for example, is Florian Grilich, um, who is Hoffenheim probably valued somewhere around 25 to 30 million would not be an unreasonable expectation. We talked about him as a possible Fernandinho replacement in the um, video that we did on that. 
he's a versatile player because he's come through Hoffenheim where, you know, they, they play in, they, they tweak how they play on a match by match basis. So he's, you know, he's come up under an intelligent coach, tactically astute coach in Nagelsmann. He can play as a left back, probably. He can certainly play as a defensive midfielder or a central midfielder or a left wing back. And he's the kind of guy who, sounding in some ways quite similar to Daily Blint. Well, who, of I, course, I was they, just thinking of Daily Blint. And, and who I think, seemed to be woefully underutilised. Right. I mean, or was just lost on, on uh, Mourinho yeah. after Van Gaal left. I think that's part of it. I think that, that Blint was probably associated with Van Gaal's style of football, which was felt to be quite pedestrian. A failed experiment. Right. Um, although obviously you need to allow experiments time to, to bear fruit and come to fruition. And, and, and I don't think that was given. But I mean, the, if you're looking at a sensible transfer for Manchester United as a central midfielder, you let him go, mm -hmm. or two of them. You've let Daily Blink go and you've let Herrera go. So these are mistakes, in my opinion. But So someone like Grilich would, would be able to come in and fulfil that role. Someone like Eric Pulgar, uh, who's at Bologna, who's one of the best defensive midfielders in uh, Serie A, has mm. had a fantastic season. What's his name? Eric Pulgar. He's Chilean. How do you spell his surname? P-U-L-G-A-R. I think people might wish to look him up. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just, I've got my notebook. Uh, for anyone look watching, uh, incidentally, you can, you can watch us on uh, the, the YouTube channel oh, yeah, Tifo yeah. podcast as well. You can see that Alex has manically scribbled notes in a notepad. It's a bit like a scene from The Beautiful Mind. Do you remember that? When you, <laughs> in the future, you come to the solemn realisation that you are, you're not a football scout and it was all a dream. It was all a dream, <laughs> yeah. So um, he's, he's looking at about sort of six interceptions per game. He's got a good rate of long passing. Uh -huh. um, I, I, think, I think United, first and foremost, United need to work out whether they're playing a two-man midfield or a three-man midfield, yeah. um, whether Pogba is going to play as a proper 10 or not. Yeah. These are all questions that are quite difficult to answer and, and they all feed into why if I were United I would be playing a three man midfield I'd be looking at someone like Grilich or Pulgar to anchor that another name I just want to chuck in is a guy called Teje Savernier uh, who is currently at Nîmes I would um, say spell the surname there as well okay the surname is uh, S-A-V-A-N-I-E-R okay um, he is. We'll drop these names in the description, by the way. Yeah, as well, in case he's a wants really, to look them up themselves. really interesting guy. So he's 27. Um, he's had an exceptional season for Nîmes, who were uh, promoted to uh, Ligue 1. He was with them throughout that promotion process, so he played in Ligue 2. Uh, he's being linked with a couple of moves within France, particularly to Montpellier, which is funny because Nîmes and Montpellier are quite big rivals. Um, but for somebody who he gets through a lot of good defensive work, but he also has a really, really good eye for a long pass, particularly um, switch passing, playing the ball out to the wings. So this is the sort of player who I would be looking at if I were, certainly if I were kind of an upper mid-table um, Premier League side, wanting somebody who was a progressive passer but wasn't going to shirk defensive responsibilities. You can pick someone like him up for probably between 10 and 15 million mm -hmm. rather than spending 50 or 60 on someone like Paredes or, you know, it just, it's about making use of, of the resources that you've got available and working out exactly what football is a series of questions that you're looking to solve, right? And whether that's on the pitch or, or off the pitch. And the question here is, can we get a midfielder at a sensible price who can defensively work hard but can also facilitate transitional play? And someone like um, Savernier, who you know, people who don't pay attention to Ligue 1 would not have heard of, is exactly that kind of midfielder. Yes, he's 27, so maybe slightly too old, but then you're not investing a huge amount of money in him. And I think United at, at this point, and this is the, the, the final thing I'll say on this one, is that United... I think would need to look for players who are not necessarily star signings at this point. I think they want to look for players who have something to prove, who uh, see this move as being kind of the, the moment that they arrive and then announce themselves on a stage rather than players who have already done a lot and already won a lot. Because 
they need leadership. They need they need a kind of they need that bite and and I think players who've kind of earned the right to be there rather than swanned in with a huge reputation are the players that can assist in that process. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Um, the next one uh, is in from Robbie Crowshell, uh, and it's about Liverpool. Uh, Robbie would like you to identify a left back, presumably a backup option. I would have yeah, thought. I, I think a backup. I mean, you know, Liverpool have got the best uh, fullback pairing in the Premier League, possibly one of the best fullback pairings in in world football currently. So, I don't think Goodness. there's any. I know, right? It's mm-hmm. so exciting. I don't think there's any requirement for them to be looking for a first choice. Uh, left back Robertson is young, seems to be you know relatively healthy. So this is somebody who works as a rotation option, mm-hmm. um, somebody who can who can fill in. From that perspective, uh, what I looked for was teams that um, defensively pressed a lot, um, because obviously you want somebody who's used to pressing and somebody who can kind of come in and adapt to that style relatively quickly. Um, Liverpool have mostly signed defensive players either from Germany or from England, but I didn't really find anybody that that matched that. I mean, Nico Schultz, who's a fantastic left back, has has been picked up by uh, Borussia Dortmund, so he's out of play anyway. Although he's he's great. Um, would he Would he want to sit on the bench at Liverpool? I don't think he would want to sit on the bench at Liverpool, but he would provide really good. Uh, competition competition for Robertson and, and there is you know the Pep Guardiola theory is that you have two equally strong players for every position and they're always contesting it and that's one of the things that I think drives that works you if you're Pep Guardiola possibly <laughs> and you have a bucket full of players who want to play for you and and a bucket full of money yeah but I mean this is Liverpool they are the champions of Europe now so they they are a hugely attractive proposition does Jurgen Klopp s- have the same appeal as Pep Guardiola um not to you not actually oddly probably to me more than maybe to some players uh-huh. um I, I i mean i think clubs amazing but that's a personal thing so yeah so i've looked for for somebody who you find him personally amazing yeah i do i have a bit of a crush on jürgen club i don't think there's a problem with that where have you looked then if not in germany and england well i've looked in holland and i've looked in spain okay um i mean i did look in germany and england as well i just didn't find anybody um so the, 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 the prospect is a guy called Angelino who's been playing left back for PSV um, and he's crossing almost six times per game with almost a 40% accuracy, which is really good. You want a fullback who's getting up, playing uh-huh. aggressively. Um, interceptions, not bad at all. Um, he's also got a pretty good uh, dribble success rate. So he's taking the ball on three and a half times per game, at almost 70% success rate. He's, and PSV, do they press in a similar fashion to Liverpool? They are one of the two highest pressing sides in uh, the Eredivisie. I mean, obviously the the numbers there are relative to those leagues, so it it doesn't mean they press as much as, as well as Liverpool. But what it does mean is that that relative to their league, they're at the top end of the pressing. So I've used a stat there called um, PPDA, passes per defensive action, which is basically an indication of how much you let the opposition have the ball before you're winning it back. Mm -hmm. So the lower the PPDA number, the higher you press, the more you press. Um, The other guy who might be worth looking at is, uh, because Angelino is a prospect, he's probably, I mean, he's valued at 12 million, but it would take more than that to buy him, is a guy called Jose Angel. uh, Who plays for... All the Angels today. All the Angels. Uh, He plays for for Liverpool. Ibar. Now he's, oh, in Spain. Yeah. Right. So he's, he's 30. Um, and this is why potentially, you know, he's, he's a kind of a, a backup. But mm. Ibar have had a very, very good season. Ibar are probably the most pressing side in Spanish football. They're, they're really aggressive. They defend in a very un-Spanish manner. But his attacking metrics are also good. So he's getting six crosses in per game at 40% accuracy. Um, he he's getting up the pitch. He's adding from an attacking perspective, as well as being from a team who are defensively really, really solid. So if you're looking at somebody, and and Jurgen Klopp is not afraid to bring in, you know, older veteran type players to to fill these bench positions because Liverpool are a very, very system based side, and they're a very first eleven based side. You know, they 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 can, if they will, play pretty much the same team 
game by game. I know there have been tweaks in midfield and midfield roles, but otherwise there's a great degree of consistency. So when you look at people like Ragnar Klavan, who came in as defensive cover for Liverpool from Augsburg, I think he cost about five million, six million pounds. You know, Klopp will look for sensible acquisitions to provide a bit of experience, a bit of solidity, somebody who's very professional, ready to step in uh, and fill that, but is not going to ever be a first choice. And I'm sure those players know that. Now, I, it may be disrespectful to Ibar to, to see them as the sort of club that would be okay with that kind of um, transfer and, and their player being seen in that way. But he's certainly somebody that I would look at. He would definitely do a very solid job for them. Okay, Robbie, I hope that answers your question. Um, Anton, Anton Olivier, or Anton Oliver, I'm not sure, uh, asks for a centre forward for West Ham. I'm going to throw my hat in the ring here and say, and Andy Carroll, is he still at West Ham? He's at West Ham, isn't he? He's still at West Ham? I think he's still at West Ham. Okay, so you're looking well, maybe for, he's been for an Andy, Andy Carroll, uh, what do they call a twin? I'm not uh, looking yeah, for a an doppelganger. Andy Carroll, no. Uh, a replacement. Um, so there's there's another centre forward on our list um, as well for Southampton. And what's quite interesting is that actually I, I've got a very separate suggestion for Southampton and we'll come to that in due course. But otherwise, some of the names that are coming up uh, um, in, in my research are names that are also generally being peddled around. Um, so um, uh, Philippe uh, Matata, um, he's got a first name, but I've, I mean, I really can't read what I've written here. It's a beautiful mind, folks. It's like, honestly, someone was saying to me, it's, it's fine if you can read your own handwriting, but I, I can't. Jean-Philippe Matata, there we go. Okay, into the microphone, sir. Quite how that's a Jean, I don't know. Anyway, um, he was all over Twitter yesterday. He's a Mainz player. He's being linked with all and sundry, and he was somebody who straight away leapt out. If you're looking for a striker, and particularly if you're West... So I looked at West Ham specifically. Mm. West Ham's issue is shots in the box, basically. Right. So they they have a lower shot volume than what you'd expect for a team that finished where they did. They exceeded their XG, so they scored more goals than the quality of their shots would suggest last season. But that's because some of those shots were kind of worldies from outside the box and they do have a tendency to shoot from quite deep and this isn't sustainable exceeding your xg um it, you can't assume it's sustainable no and and certainly it's not sustainable if the way you're exceeding it is through shots from outside the box um, by people like arnautovic so unless they were to change something uh, you might expect that uh, they would score less goals next year exactly and then commensurately fall on the table so what you're looking for, and I think Southampton, this is why I bunched the two together to a degree, Southampton are looking for the same kind of thing. They're, they're, and actually most teams will look for the same kind of thing. They, if, if I were recruiting a striker on the basis of numbers alone, which obviously you'd never do, because mm. you'd want to watch them too, but um, you look for high shot volume, ideally you look for a high XG output as well, even if that's not matched by the number of goals that they're scoring, because what that means is they're getting into good positions, they're shooting regularly, and they're, they're finding opportunities to score, even if those opportunities aren't going to be, aren't being converted, because they will be in due course, probably. How much of this, though, is about the players finding them? Because, for example, could you not have... It's a very a, good point. A, a, looking for a needle in a haystack, someone who uh, is totally capable of, uh, or has fantastic movement, gets himself into the right positions, but it hasn't, isn't, isn't being fed the ball from, from the midfield. Yeah, so so it's very very tricky to to try and find those players. They fall through the stat gaps. I guess to a degree they can. Yes, because obviously, you know, what what you're asking for there is something that's really hard to quantify. When when people are recording what happens in matches, clearly that is relative to the position of the ball and is there, so is there actions a... around the ball. So if you're right. making amazing runs, that if you were found with a pass would be a golden goal scoring opportunity, but you're playing with a midfielder who can't like, it's going to be very, very hard to find those people purely off numbers. And there is yes. no metric that accounts for, for that as of yet. No, because progressive runs, which is a metric involve carrying the ball. So yeah, it's, it's really, really hard. Um, 
Having said that, you know, the, the scouting process is is still quite thorough. So if you've got somebody who is doing that, the chances are that at some point they'll have the opportunity to play for a better team who will be able to find the ball. And what, you know, something that's interesting to note is that if you're, if you're a player who's putting up good volume of numbers at a, say, at a Serie B side with inferior quality teammates, the chances are that if you move up, you'll at least match those numbers because mm. playing with better teammates does demonstrably improve your output or at least allow you to maintain a similar output, even if you're moving up a level. Okay, that's interesting. So some of the names that we've got, this uh, Jean-Philippe Matata, um, so 0.42 XG per 90, that's really nice. That's saying that roughly, uh, you know, a goal every two games expected out of what he's shooting. He scored 14 goals. One of the things I like about him is he four of those goals were headed goals. So again, you're looking for a striker who's well-rounded, somebody who's able to score with the head as well as with feet. Um, he's taking over three shots per 90, which is good, high volume. Somebody else who's worth looking at, a guy called um, Habibu Diallo, um, who's a Senegalese striker at Mets. Again, high volume of uh, shots, but he's actually getting 0.57 XG per 90, um, which is the highest in League 2. Um, Mets have been promoted this season so they'll be in Liga next season but you know still he's he's going to be gettable for for teams uh 16 non-penalty goals also scored 10 penalties so that's that's pretty impressive slightly left field one um but will probably be familiar to fans of football manager a guy called Ezekiel Ponce yes p o n c e so he's at uh, Ike Athens currently on loan from Roma um he's Argentine, but has dual Argentine and Italian nationality, so you could circumvent work permit rules there. Um, well, I not for long. <laughs> not for long. Ike <laughs> do have an option to buy and could well be tempted to do an Eintracht Frankfurt, which is to exercise the option to buy, as Frankfurt did on Jovic, to promptly sell him for way, way more money. Mm -hmm. um, he scored 16 goals, one of which was a penalty. Um, his XG is 12, so he's he's exceeding his XG for last season, which is generally a good sign if it's sustained. Um, also, again, taking almost three shots per game and is relatively valued quite um, low. But so probably he's valued at about 4 million. You could probably therefore get him for about twice that. Now, he's only 24 um he's also got a high number of assists he again scores with head as well as feet and gets high shot volume if you're looking at Serie A sides there's often quite high quality players that are on loan or coming back from loan and particularly with someone like Roma who are you know they're, they're looking to kind of put themselves forward and compete in Serie A they're the sort of club who probably will be looking to spend quite a lot of money on on a big name signing. Edin Dzeko has been phenomenal for them this season and actually is still towards the top end of strikers in Europe from a statistical level, but he's 33. So they're going to want to replace him. Someone like Ponce, who is very, very good, but isn't a big name, isn't a star, hasn't really settled in Rome, could well be the sort of player that you could pick up for not very, very much money. Okay. Um... Anton Olivia, hope you hope you uh, feel that that answered your question. Alex Walsh asks Watford centre back. Now you mentioned before that we're also looking for uh, centre backs elsewhere. What distinguishes uh, this in this case? What are Watford specifically looking for in a centre back? So Watford's biggest problems last season were uh, contesting the ball in the air uh, and mistakes, basically defensive lapses. So what I've looked for are um, defenders who are quite aggressive, who are going to push forwards and, and win aerial duels, defenders who are tall. So I looked at, I didn't look at anybody who's under five foot ten, uh, and defenders who win a high number of aerial balls, and ideally defenders who concentrate well. I mean that's really difficult to gauge off off video scouting. Um, but the sort of thing you're looking for is a defender who appears to always be looking around, who's checking where his teammates are, who's, 
who seems switched on, who's not prone to lapses in concentration. So for example, I, I, I Ajax have signed this really exciting central defender from Argentina, a guy called um, uh, Lissandro Martinez, who oh, I can't remember the name of the club he was at, Defensa Justica, I think possibly. Anyway, phenomenal passer of the ball, like really, really elegant central defender, 21 years old. But if you watch him, he quite often gets caught out defensively because he's pushing quite far up. He wants to carry the ball forwards. He's quite aggressive in that regard and gets balls played particularly over his right-hand shoulder all of the time. So he's the kind of defender who I would say, yes, I mean, he's going to be excellent. Yes, he's going to be valuable, but he's not what Watford need at the moment is my point because he's going he's gonna to compound exactly the sort of mistakes that Watford want to avoid. Watford want a no-nonsense defender. They want Yeri Alvarez. <laughs> now, Yeri Alvarez is uh, 24 years old. Um, he Good is, age. Yeah, it is a good age, actually. Mm. Both of the guys I picked for Watford are quite young. Um, and he's an athletic Bilbao. Right. Athletic club de Bilbao. Good club. being pedantic. Um, good club. Possible issue around buying from them, because mm-hmm. obviously they, they have the Basque-only rule. Tough so to replace him. It is tough to replace him. and. Uh, they, they usually attach quite high release fees. Having said that, they are also very pragmatic and they're one of those clubs that tends to line up replacements ahead of the For requirement. This precise to reason. Exactly Watford that. have some money as well. Watford have some money as well um, and a Spanish coach. Um, so he's winning 5.6 aerials per 90, which is good. Um, he makes quite a lot of tackles. His long passing accuracy is also good. Uh, And he's getting over two interceptions per game, which again shows that he's the sort of aggressive defender who's comfortable of stepping out of the line. He's very solid and he doesn't make mistakes or makes very few mistakes, I think. From from what I watched of him, he looked... Athletic club are kind of like, they're the tough club in in Spain, along actually with with Ibar. Mm -hmm. They're they're quite no-nonsense in their style. And so I think he's the sort of defender who would very comfortably transition to the Premier League, comfortably transition to Watford style and provide a good physical aerial presence at the back while also avoiding mistakes. Another guy that might be worth looking at is called Mark Oliver Kempf. um, And he's at Stuttgart. Now Stuttgart are a good club to look at because they will be playing in Bundesliga 2 next season, having lost the uh, playoff to Union Berlin. And I know, but they're great. Um, so they will have players um, who are probably available. Maybe there are uh, relegation release clauses. Um, Kempf is only 22 years old, um, aerially excellent. Yes, there would be a question mark over uh, recruiting a defender from a club that's been relegated and conceded quite a lot of goals. However, from what I've seen, there's enough about him to suggest that, that you know, it, it's not, it wasn't all his fault. There was a lot of other stuff going on at Stuttgart. There was quite mm-hmm. a lot of stuff going on off the pitch as well. For somebody who is likely to have the ability to step up and improve those numbers playing with a higher level side and somebody who may well be available quite cheaply because the club he's playing for has been relegated, I would look at Stuttgart. There's a, they've got a defensive midfielder there as well called Arasia Bar, an Argentine guy who would be definitely worth looking at for clubs who want a sort of thuggish midfielder okay. mid-table. So, yeah. Uh, Sagasaurus, Sagasaurus, uh, Leon, centre-back. This is an interesting one. Yes, it is an interesting one. Um, as you examine as I your examine left scrawlings. My crazy scrolls. Yes. Yeah. So what does it say? Just read me the first thing that's written there. Uh, Leon underlined CB through balls. Uh, ex- oh, mm, yeah, this is an interesting point, actually. Mm-hmm. So Leon have got a couple of good centre backs, um, and they're, they're probably not that likely to sell them. Jason Denyer has been phenomenal this season for Leon. Um, Leon's problem is actually in defensive midfield. Mm. So they're looking at Otavio, who's a Marseille defensive midfielder. Um, Thiago Mendes is quite possibly going to be sold by Lille as well. So actually, although we've been asked to find a Leon centre-back, and I do have a couple of suggestions, I think Leon's 
issue really is is a defensive midfielder. Which is odd because they've got Lucas Toussaint, who I think Premier League clubs should definitely be looking at. Um, probably Arsenal should look at him. Um, but he doesn't seem particularly happy there um, and may wish to leave. There's obviously, they've, they've got a change of manager. Um, so it'll be interesting to see Leon, Leon are one of those clubs who develop phenomenally good players in-house and are then quite happy to sell them for, for a good profit because, again, they've got some youngsters lined up. In that spirit, uh, the two people that I found are, um, oh, apparently Leon are rumoured to be looking at Eric Bailey, which to me makes no sense at all. Eric anyway, Bailey. Or Bailey, however sure, you say his name. Sure. Um, a guy called Benoit um, Badiashili, um, who's at Monaco. Now, Monaco had a terrible season. Um, used... Sorry, d- remind me, are we looking at uh, defensive midfielders now or centre-backs? No, no, we're looking at centre-backs. Right, right. My point was more that yes. even though we're looking at centre-backs, actually... We shouldn't be. Eh, not that we shouldn't no, no, be, sure. but... Come on, Sagasaurus. Give him what he wants, though. I know, right. Benoit. Uh, so Benoit Badiashile, um, valued at 9 million um, at Monaco. He's 20. Okay. Both of these guys are young that I've picked. Um He's got a 92% passing accuracy, an 85% forward passing accuracy, and a 59% long ball accuracy. So 59% is quite high long ball, isn't it? Yep, it is. Um, what, what quantifies a long ball? Does it have to go past the halfway line if you're a centre-back? Um, I think so. I mean, the average, the, from memory, the average length of his long ball passing is about 35 metres. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's pinging it up there mm. and quite successfully. Is that something to do with the way that Leon are playing or is that he's just uh, incredibly precise? No, I think what, what you look for is it, it, it doesn't necessarily matter whether Leon are going to play that way or not. With, with long passing particularly, you, you want your centre-backs to be able to do both. Uh, Leon are a, a good progressive side. Whether or not they play pure possession football or not is kind of you know, a slightly moot point, but they... They have very, very quick uh, winger inside forward players. So the ability to have a centre-back who can find them with a long ball is helpful, even if they want to build from the back instead. Presumably it's also about uh, only making the pass if it's on. That's part of it. And, and awareness. And, I mean, this, this, this again is a really, really good point about, uh, a, say, for example, long passing metrics. Yeah. Is it because he's really good at kicking the ball long? Is it because the people he's kicking it to are really good at moving to be able to find that pass? Andy Carroll. Or is it because, for example, is it because, and that's, that's why Kevin Trapp's long pass numbers for, for Frankfurt were insanely high. It's part of the reason is because he was kicking to Sebastian Alla and Ante Rebic, both of whom are excellent at gathering the ball. Um, or is it because that defender is making really good decisions about when to pass long and when to pass short? And this is the point where numbers will only take you so far. You then need to be looking at what's actually happening mm. and being able to kind of marry, say, site analysis or video analysis or whatever you want to describe it as with, with numbers. So the way I have done it is I've, I've used the numbers to filter down to a number of suggestions. And then I've watched those suggestions to see whether or not... Numbers for narrowing... Prospects for watching. Right, exactly that, yeah. So so Badashile, for example, is, you know, he does look a bit raw um, and there are errors occasionally, defensive lapses in concentration and so on, but... He's young. He's the kind of player who has otherwise a lot of the attributes that you would look for and Lyon are good at taking players like that and developing them. A guy called Felix Aboa Aboa. Okay. Yeah, who's a en avant Guincamp who were relegated again. Yeah, someone over the age of 45 would say that he's so good. They named him twice. Yes. yes. But we're both under the age of 45, so we, so we won't say we that. We wouldn't say that. No. Um, he can play as a right back, Felix, but you shouldn't do that because he's not very good there. Okay. Um, but as a centre back, again, high levels of passing accuracy, high levels of tackling. He's young. He's from a team that got relegated, so you can pick him up quite cheaply. Um, and again, very dominant in the air. So these are kind of like raw. They, they've played enough in Liga for you to be able to look at them and say, in all likelihood, they'll be good players. Mm-hmm. But because of their age, because of the two clubs that they're playing for, you could pick them up, ease them into the first team over a period of time and be reasonably confident that they would hold their own 
tomorrow, but that in two years' time, they'll be way, way better. Okay. So those are Benoit Badiashile and Felix Aboa Aboa. Okay, and that was for centre-back Leon. Yeah. Uh, next up, Pud Pud On asks for a central midfielder for AC Milan. Please. Yes. Um, so the main thing here is that um, Bakayoko, I think, is probably going to go back to Chelsea. Okay. Um, because they Chelsea are likely to recall everybody who's been on loan. Well, they'll they'll have a squad of one hundred in that case. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but I think they need to mm. and then prune it down. Sure. Um, Bakayoko is he's not really settled at Chelsea, despite having been very good um, for Monaco before they bought him. Yeah. Um, he's done okay at AC Milan. Lucas Bilia, who is their other defensive midfielder, is good, but 33. So I've been looking for somebody who can, again, replicate defensive numbers. Um, I really like this guy. He's called Kento Mizau. He plays for Kashima Antlers, um, who we did a members tactics video on. Mm-hmm. Um, and incidentally, it's a, it's a good opportunity for me to let listeners know that if you enjoy the videos on the TIFO Football YouTube channel, you can click the join button below any of them and become a member and uh, watch Alex on, on a weekly basis. It'd be uh, much more informal than you will have ever heard him before. Uh, and please don't not do it because I've said this that. This is relatively informal, isn't it? This is quite informal, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Kanto Mizao, Kashima Antlers, um, he's 5'11", so he's got a good physical presence. Uh, 11 recoveries per 90. Um, he is intercepting the ball 10 times per game, adjusted for how much the opposition have the ball. Um, he's got a really good forward passing accuracy. Very, very nice long passer of the ball. He's the sort of player who has that kind of slightly quarterback feel to him. So he sits mm. slightly deeper in a midfield pivot. He shields the back four. Um, Kashima Antler's fullbacks bomb on quite significantly um they're very good by the way uh and so he's got that defensive shield role but he also will take the ball and find those long passes particularly out wide now he looks like a real a really good player to me um i think he's 24 possibly 25 so young um kashima antlers are a tactically very astute side as well that's the kind of thing i also look at um because that makes it more likely that that player will be able to transition nice and easily into a side. Yes, okay, Japanese, so there may be language issues there, but um, there is also a commercial aspect to that. And I know we said we wouldn't do it, but at You're the same time... You're breaking the golden time, rule. I've broken the golden rule. How dare you use the man's culture against him? Sure, I know. But, you know, there are there are other reasons to secure the services of Japanese players. Not... not more important reasons than them being really good at football, mm-hmm. which this guy is, mm-hmm. but those reasons are there. So, um, what are those reasons? <laughs> I feel like you should clarify them. Well, because, um, you know, Japan is a big commercial market. So if you're, if you're looking to, I mean, the, looking to grow your fan base, for example, you know, Spurs now are hugely popular in South Korea because of Song Hyun Min, mm-hmm. and, and there will be a revenue base for that as well and and you know these things are part of modern football so sure. but first and foremost Kanto is a very good player yes um and i think would fit in um quite nicely there okay um, any other names yeah um yeah this guy i think is is a real prospect um sasha oh, i mean christ knows how i even say this it's spelt z d j e l a r say that again z D J E L A R. He's Serbian. Jella. 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 So Sasha Jella. Yeah. Should we say? Jella. Probably, right. Well, yeah. you do more of these pronunciations for videos than I do. So. Well, I know, but people frequently tell me that I get them wrong. Okay. So because I do, not because they're wrong. He is. Uh, so I was having a conversation on Twitter the other day about about leagues where you can find really good players that are still undervalued. You know, sort of like Bundesliga Two was three or four years ago. Mm. Um, Your spare time is fascinating to me. <laughs> and uh, I went to the cinema the other day. Okay, and and the Serbian top division is definitely one of those places. And this guy is one of the best players in the Serbian top division. He's only twenty four. He plays for Partizan. Crucially, he's had experience in Europe as well because he was uh, he was on loan. At, uh, in fact, no, I think he was sold to Olympiakos in Greece for a while, mm-hmm. and then came back. He's also been on loan in Spain briefly. Um, he 
wouldn't cost very much at all, but he's creating 15 final third passes per game, um, making a 10 recoveries per game. So this he's like a really well-rounded, proper central midfielder. Mm. Um, 15 progressive passes per game and seven interceptions per game adjusted for how much the opposition has the ball. Those kind of numbers as an all-round central midfielder are very, very impressive. And for somebody who's still only 24, who has played in Europe, uh, I, I would definitely be looking to, to scout him a lot more thoroughly. To, and because obviously all of these are kind of, you know, not tossed out there at all because I've done a lot of work in them, but for a big club to buy them, there's going to be a lot more to that process. They're going to kind of, you know, work out whether they would fit psychologically and all of these other things. But but this is the sort of player who seriously teams should be looking at if they're not already. Okay, we've got three more to do and we're going to have to pick up the pace a little bit, unfortunately. Okay. But Marco well, Royce I can just fan, give you names. Well, uh, well, I mean, we could do a little bit more time now, but Marco okay. Royce fan asks for a, uh, a Dortmund right back, please. Okay, well, the first thing to say is that apparently Kenny Tete wants to leave Lyon. Okay. Um, Dutch international um, has been vying with Dumfries for the right back spot uh, for the Holland uh, for the Netherlands national side. If he wants to leave, someone should buy him because he's very good. Um, and if he wants to leave, he probably wouldn't cost too much. Dortmund again are probably they're looking for somebody who can kind of hold the fort. Uh, Pish Pischek 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 is he's probably got another season in him. Obviously, they had Hakimi on loan, but he's gone back to Real Madrid, so that's why there's this kind of slight void here. I found two, I mean, if they can sign Tete, they should, but I found two proper bargain basement options for them. Um, a guy called Nicholas Luchinger, who plays for San Gallen in Switzerland. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Um, well, Switzerland is another of these leagues where, mm -hmm. you know, the the... The, the, Uncover the gem. The upper end sides in that league are still competitive, and you're not necessarily looking for somebody to come in, nail down a a place straight away as a first choice. Sure. But he's he can cross with both feet. He's very very dynamic. Um, he's making five or six crosses every game. A lot of progressive passes as well, which is another good indication of the ability to move the ball forwards into a dangerous area. Um. He dribbles the ball really well too, and he looks like the kind of player who wants to uh, assume responsibility for attacking moves down mm -hmm. that right-hand side. So I, I liked him quite a lot. This guy is called Lazaros Rotter. Uh, <laughs> Rotter. He's Albanian-Greek dual nationality, and he plays for Zemplin uh, Mikhailovci in Slovenia. Sorry, Slovakia. Um, again, he's 21 and he would cost like peanuts. Um, literal peanuts, probably literal peanuts. Right. Um, You've he's valued by transfer mark to just under 200,000, uh, okay. euro. Well, peanuts. Yeah. I could pay for him out of my personal bank account in that case. Quite possibly. Obviously not. Obviously but, not. Uh, um, not so comparatively. three dribbles per game, 83% success rate, lots of crosses too. He's... Tivo could probably buy him though. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. But two hundred. Um, if we took out a big loan, sure. Well, what would the point of that be? I don't know. Just to okay. see if we could. Just to see if we could. Just see if we could become an agent. What are the rules on third party ownership these days? They're not keen on it. No, particularly here. All right, let's move on then. Ask West Ham fans. Um, anyway, he he looks like the sort of player who, with the right training, with the right coaching, uh, could develop into a really good player. What about a good intern for the summer? Would he? <laughs> I don't mean to mock this guy. No, okay. I, I, you know, I, I shouldn't have mocked him. I'm um, sorry. What was his name again? His name is Lazarus Rotter. Okay, Lazarus one, Rotter. One last quick suggestion. I am sorry about that. Um, I'm a bit tired. We've done. We've been talking for an hour, and sorry. I feel like I've I've really tried to restrain myself to let your let your scouting go. So, uh, Lon in uh, France, who are really good talent um, factory, uh, they have a right back called Fabien Sensone. Senzone. Uh, C-E-N-T-O-N-Z-E. Okay. Um, he's fantastic. And again, maybe maybe a bit below Dortmund's level, but he's the sort of player who you could see very comfortably stepping up to at least a kind of mid-table Premier League side, possibly okay. a little higher. Okay. Well, Marco Rosefan, I hope, uh, hope you found something in that. Stan Marsh asks, uh, 
Arsenal centre back. Stan Marsh is the sort of name that sounds like he was an Arsenal centre back in yeah, the eighties. I thought that. It? Yeah. Um, this, to, is, this is an interesting one. Yeah, I mean so, they're all interesting. Well, the first thing I'd say here is that so I was having a look at someone needs to buy um, uh, Kunde, the Bordeaux centre back. Mm-hmm. Um, he's mm-hmm. amazing. Right. He's a fantastic player. He's only twenty years old. Um, he's third highest in Liga for total interceptions, twelfth best in Liga for aerials won, uh, fourth best in Liga for progressive passing. Uh, this this is within a sort of I, I think it's like under twenty seven or something I was looking at, but he he looks straight away when you watch him like the sort of guy who could end up being a really really top level centre back. Um, PSG are apparently interested in buying him. What's his name? Um, so his I think his first name is Jason. Um, his surname is Kunde. Um, I will just double check. Sorry, Jules Kunde. Jules Kunde. Yeah. Um, and he just looks the part. You know, when you watch him, he's very elegant on the ball. He's very measured. His long passing is excellent. Mm. Um, in the course of looking at him, I came across a funny guy called Alex- Alexander Lore, who is a... Uh, ostensibly, he's a centre-back. He plays in Bordeaux's reserves, so we're getting properly <laughs> niche here. Jesus Christ. Right, I, I know, I know, I know. Um, he's, it's fine, most people will have stopped listening by now. But Alexander Lore, uh, he is a centre-back in Bordeaux's reserves. Uh, he's like 20, 21, something like that. Mm. He's five for eight, which is too short for a centre-back. However, he is a phenomenal passer of the ball. So you could probably pick him up really cheaply and turn him into a defensive midfielder where all of his defensive attributes would make sense, his passing would make sense, but the fact that he's not very tall wouldn't matter. So there's just one there for you. I'll okay. Chuck that in for free. Yep. Um, the other centre-back that Arsenal should look at is Malang Zar. Um, he plays for Nice. He's not going to be a surprise to people who, who follow Liga and follow transfer rumours. Uh-huh. Again, that, that's simply because he's very, very good. Um, I won't bother reeling off all of the numbers, but but the Nice kind of um, the Nice back line with him, Christoph Harrell, Yusuf Atal, Walter Benitez, the goalkeeper, they've all been excellent this season under Vieira. Um, and I, I think they're all worth looking at for somebody, although apparently they've said they're definitely not going to sell Yusuf Atal. Okay. But Zar and Harrell would be available for money, and Zar's only 20. So. Available for money. So that's who Arsenal should go and buy. Okay. Either of those or both. And the final one, and um, we uh, talked about this a little bit before, Luke Budd asks for a centre-forward mm. for Southampton. Yes, I believe specifically he said he will get more than 10 goals a season. Okay, well, um, I, I would say you're, you're out of luck yeah. then, Luke. Aren't you? So I would, Isn't I would, that a rule if you're a striker at Southampton? I would definitely listen to what we said about West Ham because it's the same sort of thing. Um, we have been linked with to the point of, I think, some people reporting that it's done for a deal with a guy called David uh, Okereke, um, who was in Serie B last season. Um, he looks like a decent signing. One slightly left field one um, on this would be a guy called Hendrik Weydant, who plays for Hanover 96 in the Bundesliga. Um, he is very tall. He's 1 meter 95. So that's 10 centimeters taller than, uh, what is that? That's about 6 foot 4, 6 foot 5. That's as tall as me. Yeah. Um, and would I, should I sign? Yes. I could sign. Yeah, you should sign. Definitely. I'm wearing trainers today. Um, so he's not a high scorer. Um, he only got six goals last season, but he's 23. He'd be very cheap. His XG numbers are pretty good. That's less than and, Luke asked for. Yeah, I know. But He wanted 10 minimum. Yeah, but I can't, I can't remember what it is per 90. But his 0.41 XG per 90, which is good. Mm-hmm. Um, he's good at pressing as well. And I think Southampton, Southampton are being linked with some quite good attacking players, but it's not a bad idea to pick up somebody cheaply who would fit quite neatly into both the overall pressing style of the team, which I think um, Vedant would do, but also be a decent kind of option B if, mm. if you choose to go long, for example, okay, uh, and, and play it more aerially. So... Again, Hanover have been relegated, so he wouldn't cost a huge amount of money anyway. Mm-hmm. 
definitely worth looking at. The other thing that's worth pointing out is that statistically, one of the strikers who kept coming up as being really, really good is Mitrovic, mm. um, who you know is at Fulham, has gone down. So that he definitely, I mean, he's proven himself capable at Premier League level. So it wouldn't surprise me if somebody picked him up as Nick well. Leston Villa as well, wasn't he? I mean, he he's the sort of striker who will be linked with lots of people, but he would be a sensible buy for anybody, certainly outside the top six. Mm-hmm. Um, and you could even see him fitting in, you know, again, as a sort of slightly more aggressive dynamic option as like a backup to Harry Kane at Spurs, for example. Yeah. You know, he's a really good striker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, there were five more on the list. I, I don't think you had time to research them, um, nor do we have time to We don't to have time to go discuss into them. them. But yeah. n- n- needless to say, I think there are about 500 requests. Obviously, we won't be able to get through all of those. But uh, you've had fun doing this, have you, Alex? Uh, yeah, very much so. I, I, think, I think there's something else that we could maybe do if listeners are interested in, which is to look at a couple of leagues and just pick out some, you know, some good players who are in those leagues. And Yeah. Well, we've got the whole summer. We've uh, got so the whole summer. I think we're going to do this again. Yeah. Uh, sensible transfers. Do watch out for the videos um, on uh, the TIFA Football YouTube channel. We'll be doing, I think, eight or nine of those over the summer, um, finishing the week before the the new season, the new Premier League season begins. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll continue to do some uh, podcast episodes like this. We have a few guests coming up as well, so look out for those. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, incidentally, if you do want to add to the 500 suggestions, Visit our YouTube channel. Have a look at the... Uh, Don't, though, because it's, <laughs> it's not going to make any difference. If you've got one point. that you think would be amazing, um, visit the uh, the community section of our YouTube channel. Scroll down a little bit and you will see uh, the message where we asked for them. So if you, if you want to suggest one, there's the place to do it. Um, I will ignore you if you tweet at me. But thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you have subscribed. Do leave a positive comment and a rating. God, we never that, say that. That would be it. nice. We never say yeah. that. But if you've got this far... I assume uh, there's a reason for it. Um, <laughs> Desperation. Yeah. If you haven't um, rated us on, on iTunes, which I'm informed uh, won't exist for very much longer in its current form anyway, that do, is correct. do rate us, uh, if only for legacy reasons. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll be back with you next Tuesday. Au revoir. Goodbye. <laughs>